Plymouth Sound is one of the great harbours of the world. Today it is home to the Royal Navy and the main sea training area for the Western Alliance. Now all is harmony between our nations, but it wasn't always so. Since Drake saw off the Spanish invasion in 1664, the Royal Navy has continuously fought with the French, the Dutch, the Americans and anyone else that got in the way of its expanding empire. Some said that the reason why the sun never set on the British Empire was that God was afraid of what the British would get up to in the dark. In 1806, the threat of invasion by Napoleon was taken very seriously and Plymouth was at the forefront in providing the Royal Navy with a safe haven from which they could blockade the French fleet. Enormous sums of money were spent to improve the safety of Plymouth Sound by building the world's first freestanding breakwater a task so vast that it became known as the Great National Undertaking. With the anchorage secure against the weather, thoughts turned towards protecting Plymouth Dockyard, which then, as it is now, was the largest in Western Europe. If the French invaded, it was considered to be a prime target, so to protect it, a ring of 25 forts and batteries were built around the dockyard to ward off the threat from seaborne invasion or from troops landed ashore in Cornwall and mounting an attack over land. Today many of these forts have fallen into ruin or been converted into flats, but there are still enough around to give a good idea of the huge amounts of effort that were expended and the lengths that the country took to protect one of its most prized assets. The ring of forts and batteries were mostly armed with cannons in the Napoleonic years, but by the time the Victorians arrived the technology had changed and the armaments had become much more deadly. Due to the Royal Navy's efficiency in blockading the French, most of the weapons in the forts were never used in anger, but all had to be practice fired in order to drill the gun crews in their operation. Over the years, the seabed outside the Plymouth Breakwater has become littered with literally thousands of cannonballs, Armstrong and RML shells, howitzers, rifle ammunition and a great deal more. If that wasn't enough, the Germans extensively bombed and mined Plymouth during the Second World War and many of their bombs ended up in the sea where they still remain alive today. The reason why there was so much change in armaments technology during this period is of course down to our old enemies, the French. In 1859 the French launched the very first armoured warship, La Guerre, which would eventually make all our wooden warships obsolete and cause absolute panic in the Royal Navy. Cannon fire was useless as the cannonballs just bounced off our hull because the smooth bore of the cannon could not produce enough velocity to penetrate her armour. However, all that changed in the 1860s when Sir Thomas Armstrong produced a breech-loading rifle gun. The projectiles were lead-coated to allow the rifling to grip and rotate the shell, thus giving a much greater accuracy and range. The lead coating also sealed the gap between the shell and the bore of the weapon. You can see the grooves on the lead here, which were made from the rifling as the shell was fired. This stopped a lot of the gases escaping when the gunpowder exploded, ensuring that most of the energy went into driving the projectile. Whilst this weapon proved very effective, it had a major drawback. The metal technology of the day was not really up to the task, and there were many instances of breaches blowing out, killing and maiming the gun crews. By the mid-1860s, guns reverted back to being muzzle-loaded, like this cannon. This would appear to be a retrograde step, but it had its advantages. Gun manufacture and casting techniques had come on by leaps and bounds, and weapons firing huge shells could now be safely made. These were called RML shells, rifle muzzle loading, and most of the ones used around Plymouth ranged from 13 and a half inch monsters, weighing some 800 pounds, fired by these huge guns on Drake's Island, to two and a half inch field gun pieces, weighing seven pounds. But the most common ones are the 64 pound six inch shells like these. 
Although there are plenty of these lying on the seabed, they are often disguised with a thick layer of concretion and easy to overlook. Once you've found your shell and checked it, it is sent to the surface. Once safely in the boat, Dave Page, a local diver and historian, takes on the delicate task of chipping the bomb out. You see why it makes so much mess in the water, don't you? Yeah. That's in quite good condition with the yeah. most of it, that one. Got a flat one, so there's probably a bung in the nose of this one as well. Yeah. What calibre is that one? It's probably a six inch. Yeah. In fact, on a lot of them, you can sort of read it on the bottom there. I think this one's a bit too far gone. Well, this is a six inch, 64 pound. I'm in the sun bath. Um, RML, what that means, a rifle muzzle loader. You can still see him fizzing that. So this one will probably crack on your brass. Mm -hmm. um, what that means is it was operated very similar to a cannon. which. The, the charge was put into the gun barrel first, rammed from the front end, and then this was sat in the gun barrel afterwards and rammed down. These studs, a line of them, there's three sets of studs around the periphery of the shell, would so ride in the rifle in. The shell would be rammed to the bottom of the barrel, and when it was fired, the studs would give the twist of the rifle into the shell and give it its accuracy. You can tell this is a shell, which means it's a hollow um, projectile. Because if it was a solid one, which would be called a shot, that would come up to a point and it would be hardened, especially hardened by a, thing, a, pro, a process called the Palliser process. And it would be very hard and it would be used for armour penetration. And then any fuses that needed to be put into that would be put into the base. This one being just a shell, there's a bung in here, you take the bung out, you put a fuse in. When you fire it after preset time, the fuse sets the contents of the shell off. This one here, this has got a bung into a gunmetal brush. Usual sort of bung with the half inch square drive. Yeah, there he is there. And that should come out just with a quick thumb and you find his shell's hollow. Yeah, yeah that's lovely. Right. Again, this one should just flick out. Give it a quick tap. Now this shell probably obsolete by about 1888, 1892, something like that. So it's quite lucky this was fired about 1875, 18 to 1888, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's been in the water, look at that, 120, 130 years. And he's stinking. God. Say that now. It's completely dry this one here. Again, they were filmed from there, the black powder, in a, in a specially sort of made um, silk bag or shalloon bag or whatever they used to call it. And you would fire that off with a fuse on the front of it. Yeah. It would probably burn for about 10 or 15 seconds. I think they later they made a fuse that would go to 30 seconds. But 10 or 15 seconds, that would be about 10,000 feet away, which was about the sort of effective range of the gun. You know, so you would, anyway? Yeah, if it hit right. something. How do you date these days? Well, frequently you'll find the date sometimes stamped on the, the bun. Yeah. They've got the manufacturer's mark on them, which is the Royal Laboratories, the RL. Oh, the, the inside. The broad arrow on the inside. Yeah. The majority of them have got that. Right. But on the shell, you'll find that it'll have the description of what the shell is on the base. If we add a bit better in there, you'll see like um, 64 pounder. Mm. It would be just 6-4 with a line with PR underneath it. Yeah. And then there'll be a, a strange, like a fraction sort of number, like 1924 or so something like that. Now what that is about, I don't know. Yeah. But you'll sometimes see a date stamp there. More frequently, you'll see it between the studs on the sides. I see. With RL, which means it was made in the Royal Laboratories as well. Uh, 
here and clean this one up. You might even see it because got the sides of them is pretty good on this one. Sometimes you find it even stands on the stud. In fact, there it is there, look. You get a, a single number, with the, which is the month, and a double number, which is the year. 80 something, can you see that? No. 586. So that would be... 1886. Yeah, May 86. Yeah. That would have been mid. Well, when it was fired, you got no way because you don't know how long they stored these things. Because um, I think it's Dartmouth Castle still had these operation. It was anti invasion thing in 1940. Look at this as well. The metal goes so soft. You can see there, it's just like putty. Mm. Yeah, there's some markings starting to show through. You notice on these, in the line of the studs, there's three little dimples. On the nose, there's one there. There should be another one around here. Yeah, there. What that was for, because these shells were muzzle loaded, yeah. to get them out, you've got to pull them from the front. Mm -hmm. So what they had, they had like a long staff with a, um, like a claw on the end. The claw would ride down the muzzle in, uh, down the rifle in of the muzzle from the muzzle end. They would click into those, and then they would twist the shaft to lock it, and they, would, they could withdraw the. Right. The projectile. Oh, and this being a, a six inch shell is quite a small one. Mm. Some of the bigger ones, they go up to I think about 13 and a half inches, which would be about that big and about so tall. They're probably coming off about seven or eight hundred pound weight. So quite a thing to pull around. Trail! Left! Whilst all this technical change was going on, the cannon was still being used. And today there are many of these to be seen all over Plymouth. Some are being used as bollards, some as decorative items, some are still used as corner posts, and a great many are still lying at the bottom of the sea. Although there were very many different types of cannon, the mainstay of the fleet was the 32 pounder, which could be used on ships as well as shore batteries. Right. Jesus Christ. Can you flash? <laughs> Cannonballs can be found almost anywhere on the seabed around Plymouth, but are probably most prolific in the area between the Shagstone and the Mewstone, because it was used extensively for target practice. Once you've found your cannonball, it was important to find out what sort it was. Most are just solid metal, but some had a hole in the top, like this one, into which went a wooden bung, which was a rough and ready fuse. These were really mortars, and were filled with black powder, which even today yeah. is still explosive when it dries out. Dave and his friends have been diving around Plymouth for more than 30 years and in the early days it was quite common to find plenty of shells that still had propellant in them, especially on shipwrecks sunk during the two world wars. One wreck that had lots of ammunition was the Polmic, which sank in 1940. 40mm shells used for anti-aircraft guns were often found complete, and once the divers found a whole locker full. Although the warheads had rotted, the sticks of cordite that made up the propellant were still live, and when they were dried out years later, could still be ignited. Must be shaved. Most shells use either cordite or gunpowder as their propellant, but all have a base fuse that has to be struck by the firing mechanism to set that propellant off. This is a two-pounder pom-pom case, and this one, we can unscrew the primer off the base, and we can see it's definitely been fired. He's safe. So what would have happened in this instance, the firing mechanism of the gun would have gone into the centre of that and set off a small fulminate of mercury charge containing its base. That we were set off a small explosive charge in the magazine there, which in its turn would have flashed into the main propellant charge contained inside the shell case. In this case, it would have been cordite 
that would have rapidly burnt, produced the gases necessary then to throw the or to send the projectile out the barrel of the gun. Right, that's a primer in that one, but nearly all shells have a primer of some sort. Now this here is an 1882 Nordenfeldt shell, and we can see in the bottom of that there's a little percussion primer. That would have done the same job as that. The operating mechanism would have hit the primer, set the main charge off. In this instance, was black powder, uh, gunpowder. Again, sent the projectile out the barrel of the gun. This is another type of Nordenfeldt shell, a rather larger one, a three pounder. Same on the same idea. It's got a little percussion cap in the centre. Within this instance, a protector. That would have had a little rubber bung in it to stop inadvertent striking of the primer in the magazine in the, on the ship. That otherwise would have sent the bullet out the end or the projectile out the end into the side of the ship or anybody handing it. That's a percussion primer. As technology moved on, we went on to electrical primers. We've got an example here, and this would have been fitted to more modern guns, probably from the First World War onwards, when you had director firing, you had to need to fire the guns all at one go. But an electrical contact in the center. That, when you press the button, would have sent an electrical circuit through all the all the guns together and in this instance what we have had in here under this cap would have been a little charge the electrical circuit would have been made set a spark into the charge that would have ignited fired through into the back of this thing which was fitted on the end that would probably have been full of black powder that would then have ignited the main charge of the cartridge out goes a projectile at the barrel of the gun. The smaller version of this, same idea, that would have possibly been fitted in a 12 pounder or a four inch gun. Uh, this is just a basic percussion cap in the bottom. Again, it would have fired into that magazine there, full of black powder. That would have encased the cordite in the, in the, in the uh, shell case. When it was fired, ignited the cordite and sent the projectile at the end of the gun. All the primers we've been showing you so far have been deactivated and there's a good reason for that because although it's unlikely that they will go off if they did they pack quite a punch and cause a bit of damage this is a modern primer and it's been fitted into a cartridge that's roughly the equivalent of a colt 45 pistol round right what we're doing here is taking the end of the round off so we can get the charge out of the bullet because if the primer goes off and sets this bullet off, it'll probably take a side of my shed out. Right, we've now cut the charge. I'm taking the powder out. And you can see it's just normal black powder. Down the bottom, we can see the mouth of the primer. And all we've got there now in this cartridge case is just the primer. That will still make a right mess of your fingers if it goes off. Well, we've got our cartridge now with no powder in, so I'm putting it in the vise and we'll detonate it by applying some heat. Some shells have fuses to ensure that they explode at a preset distance from the gun, like this 13 pound artillery shell that fired shrapnel. There are many different types of fuses, but this is the type that is most often found. Dave Page now explains. Well, this fuse was found about two miles outside of Brightwater, and given that it's been there for the best part of 100 years, give it a couple of days in fresh water, and it will simply unscrew, just like this. Now, we know this one's safe, because it's got the letter P for practice, and MT for basically empty. So this one, when we take it apart, present no problems. On the bottom of the fuse, we can see a set of numbers. And this would have been part of the timing mechanism, which determined how far the shell went from the gun before it exploded. And if I take the fuse apart now, you'll see what was inside it. Now, in this hollow space would have been the arming mechanism for the uh, fuse, which would have activated the fuse once it had been fired from the gun. That would have then set off the trail of gunpowder, slow burning gunpowder, inside this little ring in there. That then, once it had been set by the time 
on there determined how long it would burn. Once it had reached the end of its burn, there's another trial in that one as well, the flash from that gunpowder would have gone down inside the fuse, set the little magazine off that was on the back of it, and exploded the shell. Amongst all the big shells lying on the seabed are plenty of small arms ammunition. These solid lead bullets, for instance, are very common and come from a one-inch practice aiming round used on guns such as these at Penley Battery in the early 1900s to avoid firing the full charge. In this photo you can see the aiming gun piggybacked on top of the main gun barrel. The bullet was a development of the round used in the Nordenfelt gun, an early machine gun used by the Navy in the 1880s. 303 rounds are also very easy to find, as the Lee Enfield rifle was the standard British service rifle throughout two world wars and well into the 1960s. This round, however, nicely shined up by Dave, is a much rarer find. It was fired from a Martini Henry rifle, which started life in 1879 and was still going strong in the Irish troubles in the 1970s. Good. And that. John Simons of the Royal Garrison Artillery demonstrates how the weapon works. Single shot weapon. The action is such that you thumb down the lever, block goes down, exposes the bore. One round, it's 450 at the top, it's 577, it's a bottle cartridge. A lot of packed into a small space. Round goes in, as it goes in, you close up. Right. You notice then there's an indicator on the side, and I say it's an indicator, it only tells you if it's cocked and it's live. You run your thumb off the grip, do you feel a point? Yes, it's cocked. Then it's up into the shoulder, thumb in the grip, present fire. Now to eject then, lever comes down, the block falls, the extractor is engaged and it ejects the cartridge out to the floor. Over the years, Dave and his friends must have found literally tons of different ammunition, but never anything that fired it. That changed one winter's afternoon when Dave came across what he thought was two shells fused together. Once he started hitting it with his hammer, however, he realised to his excitement that he had found a four-pounder cannon. Because the cannon was quite small and in such good condition, Dave decided to lift it the following weekend. The weather, however, had other ideas. During the week, the wind blew with increasing ferocity and a long swell stirred up the seabed. Dave was worried that the cannon would be damaged, so when the wind eased for the weekend, he decided to push ahead. While the sea was quite calm, the visibility down below was so bad that Dave had trouble finding the cannon. And when he did, he found that the lifting pack had started to split and couldn't lift the cannon. Not one to give up, he stuck it on the boat winch and finally, there it was at last, safely in the boat. Come down. Oh. I'll be dead. <laughs> it's a good fit then. <laughs> Well, you don't like shitty water. No, you? no, too right, yeah. Dave now spends his time searching for cannons, but all he finds is shells. Ah, well, one day. Hi, Gold. Too late, Brasso, we've finished. Oi, oi, oi.